Hey guys, welcome to this fun episode of TFL Car Chat. And uh, you'll note that my man Tommy isn't sitting next to me. And that is because, uh, well, he's stuck at home for now. He's on his way because uh, our long-term 1987 Porsche 911 wouldn't start. Um, and in this episode, what we're going to do is we'll be talking about some of the most interesting uh, long-term cars that we've had and uh, what we think of them and um, how they did. So this is appropriate because this has been a tale of woe and money and pain. And it started about, gosh, it must be four years ago now when uh, we decided, I should say I decided, that we wanted to get a classic 911. And spent about a year looking for one. This was going in just before COVID, so right before COVID. So prices were still reasonable, and I noticed that uh, a lot of them were pretty used up in my price category. My price category was about $30,000. I know that sounds light for today, but back then you could still get a classic Porsche for that amount of money. Finally, one popped up, and it was right next to uh, Boulder and Longmont, and I was so excited because it was unique. It was a wide body, and it just looked really badass. It had the wrong wheels. It had the wheels from the next generation Porsche. And so I called the owner, and I went and looked at it. He uh, let me use, let me drive it. He lent me the keys, went for a ride. Everything seemed to work. All the gauges seemed to work. The car had just under 100,000 miles, which psychologically is kind of a good number. Over 100,000, something happens, and just the value drops. I think it was like 98,000 at the time. And um, there were some signs of trouble. Uh, I noticed uh, that there were some, not mouse droppings, but mouse detritus in the car. He stored it outside with the cover. Uh, and later I came to find out that uh, a family of mice had made their home in the car. Uh, but that wasn't the problem. So, uh, you know, kind of the way you do often without thinking about it too much, uh, just decided to buy the car on the spot. Uh, and the thing about the car that I didn't exactly like, but because I had spent so much time looking for one, I kind of gave up on getting the perfect 911, classic 911, is that this one was a convertible. And I thought to myself, you know what? I'm not tracking this car. It'll be a fun car to drive in the summer with the top down. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, like a modern convertible. The other warning flag that I should have heeded was that it wasn't a manual convertible, but it was an electric convertible. So anyway, I get the car, and uh, the first thing I do when I get it back to the office is because in Colorado, if a car is 1976 or younger, it has to go through emissions. So I'm like, you know, I'll just get emissions done uh, right away and get that over with. So I drive from the office to the emissions place, which isn't very far. Maybe it's less than two miles. And I'm very nervous because now I'm starting to kind of realize what I had done. I kind of jumped into the deep end of the classic carpool without actually thinking it through. Uh, and I'm wondering, will this thing even pass admission, uh, emissions or smog in California would be what you guys call it. And I'm a little nervous, but, you know, the car is not smoking. Uh, it's running great. Uh, and it passes emissions with flying colors. And I am so relieved and so happy that I'm, you know, like pumping my fist in the air with the top down. Uh, because, by the way, the guy did sell it to me with this top down. It was a wonderful summer day, so I didn't even try putting the top up, but it was just down. Hey, podcast listeners and TFL Talk viewers. I wanted to take a minute to talk to you about a quick and simple way to sell your car or truck with the help of our new partner, High Road. With High Road's online portal, you enter your vehicle's VIN number or plate, mileage, and zip code, and you'll get competing offers from several qualified dealers in your area within seconds. You pick the best deal offered and follow through with the dealer to sell your car. No more managing scammy emails from buyers on Craigslist or Facebook Marketplace. No more time wasted on no-show buyers. No bait and switch with a, will you take a check excuse from sketchy buyers. Now keep in mind, these offers will be for trade-in values of your vehicle. If you want to go through the hassle of getting more for your car, that's up to you. But if you want to sell your car hassle free and fast, go to tflcar.com and click sell your car in the navigation menu. Or click on the high road ad at the bottom of the website if you're on mobile, or 
click on the column if you're on a desktop. High Road makes it easy, and we like easy. Anyway, so um, yeah, I uh, I um, go to drive it back to the office, and the car immediately dies. It just cuts off, just dies. And I'm like, uh-oh, that's not good. But start it up, it starts right up, and I'm like, oh, probably a fluke, something happened. Not, no big deal, you know, maybe two minutes later, dies again. And I'm like, oh, God, I should have taken a longer test drive. And I guess what had happened was the car, of course, got warm, and things tend to kind of heat up. They tend to kind of spread apart. They expand. Uh, and I'll get into what happened eventually, but I'm like, this is not good. So um, then I drive it home. It makes it home uh, after I stop and start a few times and I pull it in the garage and then I'm like, oh, I'll just put the top up, see what it looks like with the top up, push the top button, nothing happens. Top is completely dead. And I'm like, oh, I'm sure it's something simple like a fuse. Uh, so I, this thing still has these like old school German bullet fuses. So I go and open the trunk and I notice something or the front and I notice something odd uh, and that is that it's got a battery cutoff switch which you can assume you know why Tommy wasn't able to drive it here today because the battery had died and I'm like I wonder why it's got a battery cutoff switch and then I also noticed that it's got an immobilizer uh, and that's when I learned the important lesson that if you're buying a classic car do not buy an 80s car with an immobilizer that is like a snake that has wound itself or back in the day, the technicians wound itself throughout the entire ignition system. Uh, and nobody, as far as I know today, unless there's some old dudes left, knows how to remove them. Uh, and they can cause all kinds of problems because like everything over time, they stop working correctly and they can basically kill the ignition system, or in this case, drain the battery when the car is not running. So I'm like, ah, boy, I certainly missed that red flag. So top's not working, car's dying randomly. It's got an immobilizer, which I assume is killing the battery because there is a cutoff switch for the battery. In other words, there's this big red switch that you can turn the battery on or turn the battery off. Uh, and I'm like, all right, well, just another thing I have to fix. So I drive it uh, to a local uh, shop that just opened up across the street from my office. I'm like, hey, this car is dying. Uh, can you guys uh, look into it? And it passed emissions, so that's great, but it needs to not die when I drive it. It's just very inconvenient when you're driving along and all of a sudden, you know, the engine stops running. It's probably also pretty unsafe. They're like, no problem. You know, we just opened up. We know German vehicles. I'm like, great. You guys go at it. Two weeks later, I get a phone call. We figured it out. It's all sorted. It'll be two and a half thousand dollars. And I'm like, oh, that's a lot of money. And they're like, yeah, you know, got to get parts. Not easy for an 87 911 Porsche tax. I'm like, okay, great. Uh, so I go in, pay the bill, get in the car drive it out of the shop, and as I'm leaving the shop, it dies. <laughs> I'm like, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> Go back in. I'm like, you guys didn't fix it. And they're like, oh, we thought we had fixed it. And I'm like, you know, I don't trust you anymore. Please just give me my money back. Then we had a long, serious discussion, uh, at which point they finally did give me my money back uh, because I don't know what they had done or what they had done did not fix it, and I wasn't interested in all the other stuff. And then I finally decided there is just a, a specialty Porsche shop that's, you know, one town over from Boulder. I'll have to take it to them. Uh, and um, I took it over to them, and they said, yeah, we'll take a look at it. Uh, and immediately I told them the problem with the car dying, and they knew exactly what it was. So I felt like, wow, th these guys know their, their stuff. And apparently what happens in these old 911s is that there's a computer uh, that lives under the driver's seat, uh, first-generation computer, so it's pretty old. And over time, it just becomes or it becomes desoldered, uh, and then you have to basically take that little ancient computer out, uh, either resolder it or replace it with a new one. Uh, and so they did that, uh, and the car uh, started running fine. And then I said, also, the top doesn't work. And I'm thinking to myself, it's not, it's not a uh, fuse. It's probably something simple like a motor that isn't connected. And I get a call from the shop, and they said, well, apparently somebody uh, did something to the top that put it out of alignment, and then they tried closing it. And when they did that, there's two motors that work the electric top on this 911, one on either side. And what had happened was both motors came detached from uh, the chassis. In other words, 
whoever tried to put the top up, I'm assuming the previous owner had wrenched those motors off the chassis and they said, well, we'll probably have to weld them back on and then we're going to need to find an entire roof mechanism because, well, the one that you have is all bent and mangled. And I trust these guys. And I'm like, okay, do what you need to do. Go fix it. So they're like, great. One month goes by. Two months go by. I call them. Yeah, still trying to source parts. We can't find new parts for 87911 top. Uh, three months go by. Finally, a half a year goes by. No, it's more like nine months. And they call me and they said, it's all fixed. And I'm like, okay, uh, that's great. Wow. Remember, I paid about 30000 for this because now it's going to get interesting. So I'm like, great. Uh, it's, uh, you know, fall time, so I get to drive the car for at least a little bit before, you know, winter comes because I'm not driving in the winter. It's kind of too precious. Uh, and so I get there, and the first thing uh, this guy who runs the shop, who's kind of become a friend of mine, says, he goes, Roman, you're the right guy to own this car. And I'm like, why is that? And he's like, because you got the money to fix it. And he hands me a bill for $16,000. <laughs> <laughs> so now the $30,000 car just went up to $46,000 in total investment. And what they had done is for about $3,000, uh, they had fixed a little computer under the seat. Um, I also asked them to push this really cool uh, old, old looking new classic uh, radio. So it's this radio that fits into the slot where the old radio lives, but it's completely modern. So it has Bluetooth. It even has this little tiny window for navigation. Uh, so it has CarPlay. Uh, and then of course, you know, it's got much better sound. So that was, I think another two and a half thousand dollars. Uh, plus the previous owner uh, had taken off a steering wheel and put on this really ugly uh, blue, because the car is blue, like funky steering wheel. So uh, the original 911 87 wheels are like the ones you get in 944 where it's got the big airbag in the middle. It says Porsche. I just didn't like the look of it. Um, Porsche did build more of a sporty steering wheel, but I think those are, if you get one of them for, from like uh, one of the Porsche suppliers, they're like $5,000 just for the steering wheel. And I'm like, not that. Uh, so we kind of got uh, a, a very nice, elegant looking steering wheel that doesn't say Porsche on it. Uh, but it makes the car look nice. And I'm also trying to kind of slowly fix this car up and bring it back to original because I'm still thinking to myself that this half wide body is what, you know, Porsche calls Sonderwunsch. In other words, special wishes that somebody had actually uh, gone to Porsche and had decided to create, in essence, uh, a half of a slat nose. So it doesn't have the slat nose, but it's got the wide body rear end. Um, and so I'm kind of oh, quickly or slowly and expensively trying to get it back into some kind of, you know, shape that you would love to like drive it around without being embarrassed because the dash is cracked, the upholstery is bad, obviously the um, convertible doesn't work. So that was another two and a half thousand. The, the computer was like three thousand and then the rest of the ten thousand dollars was to repair the top. Uh, and I'm like, wonderful. I finally get to drive uh, my... Uh, new uh, to me, uh, 987, 911. And the car runs like a dream, don't get me wrong. It doesn't burn oil. Uh, and the other great thing, which I didn't know at the time when I bought it, was an 87 Porsche switch to, I think it's a, called a G50 transmission. Uh, the previous ones, I think it was a G15 transmission, um, the transmission was unsprung. So when you went from like second to third gear, uh, it didn't kind of guide the gear lever into the right location you had to find it. And you got used to that, but people really like the new G50 transmission. And so uh, 87 through 89, the 911 had these G50s and people really look at, look at, look for those because they're uh, much better in the purest sense of being able to drive the car. Now keep in mind, this is a 3.2 liter six flat six. So when it was new, I think it put out like 200, 20-ish horsepower, if I remember right, when I did did the did my research, uh, and it's of course not new. It's got 100,000 miles, so this is not a, a fast car by any stretch of the imagination. But it is a car uh, that is about as classic of a 911 as you can get. You know, the round dials, uh, every control is haphazardously thrown around. So, like the the convertible top control is this little funky um, toggle switch that's hidden, kind of underneath 
one side of the dashboard. If you didn't know what it was for, you would like be like, what the hell is this switch doing? And why is it placed here randomly? There's, I think, like three different sets of controls for the heater and the air conditioner. It did have air conditioning. We'd never fix that. It's a convertible. So why fix it? Uh, and the other cool thing about it is uh, it's got the big old whale tail. Um, and I love that look of the whale tail. Uh, the biggest downside is the previous owner decided that the original wheels and tires were uh, not wide enough. So he had gotten the next generation uh, all chrome wheels and they just look horrible. So they were Porsche wheels, but they were all chrome and certainly not the Fuchs that would come on this car originally. So anyway, um, I bring it home. Top still open. They made it. They showed me that it worked. Uh, at the uh, at the repair shop, get it home, and then um, I take it uh, for my like I used to go running in the mornings on Saturday for a long run, so I take it to my morning run, uh, put the top down, and um, when I get to uh, my little trailhead for the run, I go to put the top up, and it stops working again. I'm like, oh. <laughs> so luckily it's a nice day. Go for my run, bring it back home, bring it back to the shop, and I'm like, hey guys, uh, the top's not working again. Uh, and they're like, okay, you know, you, you, uh, you paid us to look at it, uh, to fix it. So we'll take a look at it. Uh, so I get a phone call back and they're like, yeah, the, uh, motors, we, we weld the motors back on, uh, to the chassis, but the welds broke and they're come off again. Uh, so we'll be happy to fix it at a reduced rate because it's kind of on us, but we're going to have to get parts. So we're going to have to source the original parts, uh, so that we can actually, um, not weld, but bolt, I think, the motors to the chassis, the way it was done originally, not kind of, you know, done as a as kind of a Band-Aid, uh, which they did because you couldn't find those original mounts. So six months later, <laughs> I get the car back. Uh, I think I paid another four or 5000 So now we're 20000 into this after the original thirty, so $50,000. And the only good news, the one bit of brightness is that now we're, you know, into COVID uh, and these old 911s have skyrocketed in value. So back before COVID, you could get a nice, let's see, 911 SC for, you know, thirty to twenty-five to $35,000. And now SCs, which this isn't, uh, are fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000. So this car is worth at least... 60, maybe even more, depending on if we can improve that it's one of those, you know, special wishes cars. So even though I'm spending a lot more money, in, you know, and getting deeper and deeper into the car, uh, the value is going up. So I'm not too terribly hurt by it. But nevertheless, I've owned it now for two years and actually had it in my possession for like two weeks. Uh, and that's not fun. So top is working. Uh, the only issue with the car is that sometimes the, the idle runs high and so it doesn't actually go back down to about a thousand rpm when you come to a stop play you have to actually put it like in second gear and then hold the brake down it is a manual of course and then uh, not, not accelerate so that you force the throttle to come down but i'm like okay if that's the worst thing i have to do with, with this car um, that's not horrible and then every time i have to go and uh uh, put it away. I not only have to turn the car off, but I got to open up the front and turn the battery off because there's still this mystery drain. So that's kind of a pain in the butt. But I'm still enjoying it on a beautiful day. There's nothing better. Uh, people are giving me the thumbs up. And I'm looking around, and the um, upholstery is really tatty. Uh, the leather, it's a blue car. It was originally a gray car, but somebody repainted it blue. Uh, but it's got a white interior, um, and the white interior is looking mighty gray. And in a lot of ways, looking it's like it's cut and broken. Uh, and so I'm thinking to myself, you know what? Uh, the value of the car has gone up. Let's fix the interior. So we have a good upholstery shop. I take it to them. Um, and keep in mind, I've had the car for now th almost three years. And I've probably had it in my possession for two months. So I take it to them. Uh, it's wintertime anyway. I think I took it to them like in December, maybe it was November. Um, and uh, once again, six months later, I get the car back and I made a fortuitous decision, which turned out to be wrong. So it wasn't all that fortuitous. Uh, they asked me, do you want to replace the top fabric? Cause it had the original fabric top. And I'm like, oh, I've been fighting this thing, but it did look ratty. It wasn't torn. It just looked ratty. The rear window was yellow cause it's plastic. I'm like, sure, replace it. So they're, so they're like, great, we'll do the upholstery. Plus whoever had done the original upholstery or had fixed it, they had like taken wood screws and put them into the carpet to hold the carpet down. It was not a good look 
for what is a very classic 911. So I get the car back in the springtime. Uh, that whole process was another 10000 So now we're, what, at $60,000? No, like at $70,000 into this car. And uh, I'm so happy. And then I get it home, and I try to put the top up, and it kind of stops halfway up. <laughs> So it's like a giant parachute. And I'm like, oh, my God, not again. Uh, and what had happened was when they had put the new fabric on the top, uh, they had um, misaligned the whole mechanism. And luckily, because we had the brackets installed on the motors, they didn't burn out the motors. What it, what it, ha- what it had happened was it had burned out the fuse. And at this point, I'm smart enough to know that if I replace that fuse, What's going to happen is I will potentially burn out the motors or wrench them off the chassis. So I took it back to the original shop, and they realigned it for like $1,500. Once again, Porsche prices. And now I have a new interior, and I have a working top. Uh, And a car that now I've owned for four years, but I've actually had in my garage. Hey, Tommy's here. I'm telling the, the story of the 911, dude. (laughs) <laughs> and then the story of woe, <laughs> and you you tried to uh, you tried to uh, bring it. Uh, you want to close the door um, so when the when the rest of the team comes in, we're not that late. You tried to bring it this morning, and of course it didn't stop, didn't start. So so finally I get the car kind of to the point where I want, and then I found some original white Fuchs online. Those weren't cheap. Uh, I think we had who who gave us the tires for it? Do you remember? I don't remember. I think it was... Um, I don't remember. I don't remember. But anyway, one of our tire suppliers supplied the tires. Uh, and then uh, the last bit of woe that, that I can tell you about this car is that about a month ago, um, the, wind, one of the, no, the driver's side window stopped working. Yes. Maybe two months ago, the driver's side window stopped working, which is also a pain. So if you want to like go get Starbucks or something and you can't roll the window down, it's kind of awkward. So I took it... Uh, uh, to Toby, usually a German car mechanic. Oh, I forgot I took it to him a few times too. Uh, and uh, he tracked down the issue and he said he tracked down the issue with the mystery drain on the battery. Uh, and so when we put it away, we stopped turning the battery off, which was a bad idea. Well, it was off this morning. Yeah. And it didn't seem to matter because the battery was still dead. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I don't know what's going on with it, but the, even with the battery, the negative side disconnected, it uh, still went flat. So I, I guess the, the moral of the story is... Um, you know, the car has since dropped in value because after COVID, the price has kind of stabilized on these. And we're probably like $65,000 into this car, maybe seventy. How much do you think it's worth now? Maybe forty. Yeah, maybe, maybe 50, 40, 40 or 50. 50. Yeah. Uh, and now it's kind of become like good money after bad. And but, I suppose if you, could, if you had the ability, which you might have, I don't, to actually do the repairs yourself, uh, then it wouldn't be that expensive. But tracking down parts, if you don't have those connections, is not easy. I know there's like Pelican parts. I know about these places. But, you know, getting uh, a, a motor mount for an 87 convertible top is not an easy find. The problem with this car, from yeah. a value standpoint, is it has an aftermarket wide body on it. We don't know that. I know for sure now. You sure? Yeah, because it has the narrow body suspension. Okay. So someone has converted this car to a wide body. And it was done really well. And actually, uh, a commenter told us the name of the guy who did it. Mm-hmm. And I looked into his conversions, and they're exactly what this car is. Mm-hmm. And really high quality stuff, like he does these steel wide bodies with box flares, and um, like the flares are Porsche. The 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 uh, the box um, fillers, the side skirts are Porsche parts. But it is an aftermarket wide body, which does definitely hurt the value of the car. So it's never going to be like a super high dollar vehicle. But it now it's at a point. Well, it was at a point before it wouldn't start, where it's a fun kind of collectible driver car. Yeah, yeah. So um, I guess this is a cautionary tale for all of you guys out there thinking about dipping your toe into the classic Porsche world. Uh, you get what you paid for. You know, I mean, I, we didn't pay a lot for it, and we didn't get a lot. Mm-hmm. But but from a drivability point of view, the car is pretty rock solid. It's pretty good. Yeah, yeah it's it, does, good. it doesn't burn oil. You know, steering doesn't yeah. shake like a scared poodle. Uh, it's not particularly fast because... That vintage, especially up at 5,000 feet above sea level, is not going to exactly um, go. But once that tack hits 4,000 RPM, that thing's a screamer, Tommy. Okay, well, what other cars did you talk about? That's it. Just this was, you know, there's so much to talk about this car that uh, that I didn't talk about anything else. Well, what do you want to talk about? Do you want to talk about our latest fleet and kind of what, what we think 
and what we like, dislike, the good, bad, and ugly of what we have? Yeah, and you know, we're very lucky that we've been able to buy a lot of cars over the years and, and then sell them, and we'll talk about some of the highlights and I think some of the misses. So right now in the fleet, yep. we have um, a few vehicles, and we've got a, a couple coming too, which I'm... Now keep in mind, I'm going to be talking about uh, the same topic with Andre in the truck podcast, so we're not covering the trucks, we're just covering the cars. Yeah, which I'm, I'm really excited about. Mm -hmm. So we recently just purchased the Space Model Defender, this 2023 Defender S90 with the little four-cylinder and the steel wheels. Yeah, and I was really bummed because it had this really like harsh ride, and I thought to myself, we made a huge mistake getting the coil springs instead of getting the air suspension, which most defenders have. Uh, and then uh, yesterday we took it, that we just published that video, we took it for a trail guide up Georgia uh, Pass, and Andre figured something out, and that is that you had taken it off-road, and then you had looked at what the little sticker on the side, and it said that the tires should be pumped up to like 50 mm -hmm. PSI, which is a lot. I mean, now we're looking at like heavy-duty truck. I think it's 48 front, 50 rear. And then if you look at the TPMS, it actually is higher than that. It's like 53 uh, and I don't know what the other side is. And then uh, in the little control panel, there's like max, uh, max. it's not towing, it's like max weight, and then there's uh, another setting for like normal weight or you know low load, I think it's called. And you can actually change what the TPMS settings are so that when you put it in normal load, it takes it down to like 40... In the low 40s and high 30s, depending on the tire. And when you do that, and what I mean by that is that, that like, if, if you don't, obviously, if you don't fill it up at, at, at whatever the setting is on the TPMS, you just get these two lights that are there all the time, right? The low tire pressure light and the little information light. And that's really annoying. But when you set it in its lower settings, that all goes away and the ride becomes really supple. I don't know if I agree. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I had it off road with Case and we were down to 23.4 PSI, which is real low. Yeah, I'm not talking about off-road. I'm talking about on-road. Yeah, maybe on-road. I still think off-road, it's too firm. Yeah. And there just isn't a lot of suspension flex with it. But having said that, I really am very happy with this car. I think it's a really nice piece of kit. It looks great. It's got a nice interior. It's got some durable features like a rubber floor. It's got good technology. It's very comfortable on the highway from a seat comfort and, and quietness standpoint. It's just a really good daily driver. Yeah, we have the base engine, uh, which is the... Uh P300. Yeah. It's a uh, 296 horsepower two liter turbo and it is plenty for the vehicle. That's the engine that we famously had problems with in our first Defender that, uh, you know, was deemed unfixable after 250 miles. This engine, though, at 10,000 miles, still trucking along perfectly. And we kind of think, you know, some people were saying, speculating that someone sold this car so soon at just 10,000 miles because of a problem. Case and I probably think it's it's because we bought it outside of Park City, Utah, a very affluent community, has ski racks on it. So I'm thinking that someone probably bought this car, got sick of the two-door thing because the rear seats are a pain to access, and then maybe sold it on, had it as like a ski vehicle. That would kind of make sense. Yeah, the great thing about it is whoever did it put on some KO2s because the ones that come from Land Rover are not trail worthy, as we found out when we blew two tires on the trail. Uh, and so that made it very uh, desirable. Plus, uh, it's got the white roof. It's got the steelies or the fake steelies, um, which are also white. And it's kind of this, ban what's the name of the color? It's called Pangea Green. Pangea Green, yeah. Yeah, so it's a really nice looking spec. Uh, and I think it kind of stole my heart when I saw it in the pictures. Uh, but buying it uh, was, well, I could talk about that process. That was also a horrible process. And I... You know, we, we use two dealers here in Colorado that we've bought cars from forever now. We use Johnson's for the Fords. Nope. No, sorry. We use um, uh, Brighton Ford for all of our Fords. And we use Johnson's Auto Plaza for uh, our Stellantis slash Chevy products. Uh, and they're just such a pleasure to work with. You know, I show up when we buy a new car. They have all the paperwork ready. Um, and, you know, I go into the office. I sit there for five minutes maybe signing stuff. And I'm out of there like that. Uh, and I forget how nice that is when you have a relationship with the dealership that you trust and you know they're not, you know, charging over sticker and you're paying what what is the manufacturer's suggested price. Or better yet, sometimes you can get a friends and family discount. It's a, so I, I had completely forgotten about this. So when I went to buy that Defender, it was over Labor Day weekend, and I called the manager and I said, "Hey, I'm with TFL." Um, and you know, um, I'm going to fly out me and Tommy on Labor Day and we're going to buy uh, this car and we'll bring you a company check. And the guy says, well, 
we only take um, cashier's checks. And I'm like, you know, I, I'd love to get you cashier's check, but it's Sunday and Labor Day, the banks are closed, so there's no way I could do this, and I can't go on Monday because I have the day off on Monday, so we could fly out there. And then the guy says, well, let me kind of look into it. And I'm, I'm like, look us up. You know, we've been doing this since 2009. We've got 50 million views a month. Where are we going to run? And then he kind of looks us up, and he says, yeah, no problem. We can make this work. Just bring a, a company check. Mm -hmm. So uh, we buy a one-way ticket fly to Salt Lake City, uh, get to the dealership, and um, this is actually a Ford dealership, uh, not a Land Rover dealership, uh, and I say, Tommy, can you go and do the intro video saying that we're going to buy the car, so you go out there, salesman is very nice, the car sit sitting out front, and I'm sitting there kind of with my thumb up my, you know what, waiting for the salesman to come back, and he comes back, and he says, there's a problem, I'm like, what's the problem, he goes, well, let, let me get you the sales manager guy and the sales manager guy comes in and he says yeah we can't sell this to you unless you have certified funds okay and i was like yes we discussed this with the sales manager when i called yesterday and i said there's Did you no mean finance manager you're talking finance man well, no the guy i was talking to was the sales manager but then but then this guy is the, the finance manager yeah. yeah and he goes well uh you know unfortunately we had somebody buy a g-wagon with a company or personal check and then you know the, the check was bad and we lost that and i'm like how's that my problem Okay. Right. This is this is your problem. This is not my problem. And I'm more more or less. I'm not the guy. And he's like, I'm not that guy. Plus, you know, this is TFL, and we're pretty well known out there. You know, like I said, we have got you know tens of millions of views on our videos every month. Um, and he's like, Well, let me go and think about it. So I'm sitting there again for 20 minutes, and he comes back. He goes, Nope, can't do it. And I'm like, At that point, I'm like, First of all. I had this discussion with the sales manager. I wouldn't have bought a one-way ticket here. I wouldn't. Have, I told him I wasn't coming if you don't take a company check. I couldn't get you certified funds uh, simply because uh, we, you know, we 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 couldn't do it because the banks are closed. And then and at that point, I was like, you know, I hate to do this, but I'm like, you know, there are two ways this can go, right? You know, we can buy this car today as we agreed, or I can be very salty. And either way, we're going to make a video. And one video, you know, you're probably going to like, and one video you're not going to like. Mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, what, what it meant for us was grab an Uber, go back to the airport, pay same-day fare to fly back home to Colorado, uh, especially after we had agreed upon it. So finally, um, they came to their senses, uh, and they sold us the car. The check did not bounce, of course. Uh, but it's just, it's just you, you forget how uh, some dealerships are just so... Um, unwilling, you know, to make the customer happy, right? It seems like the, the satisfaction of, of the customer is number 10 on their list of things that, that they need to do, right? Number one is make a profit. Number two is sell the vehicle. Number three is sell as much warranty as possible. Number four is make sure the, guy, the customer finances it so they make more money on the financing, right? Number five is sell you some stuff you never want. Like, like you know, this is classic. Like, uh, what's that thing called where... If the car is stolen, um, it, it tracks the car. I don't know what it's called. But it's I know like it's like out. a little, like, yeah, you know, I know. You know module, it's, it's basically, yeah. yeah, it's basically a twenty-five dollar air tag, and the number ten on that list is make sure the customer is happy. So, uh, not to defend the dealer, but I, I do think part of the problem is there are a huge amount of scams out there, and there are a lot of people that are trying to get cars for free. <laughs> you know, and the easiest way to do that is to write a personal check and then not have it clear. I agree. I'm not. I, I, I absolutely agree. I, I understand that they have to look out for their best interest. But that discussion happened sure. before I ever bought the airplane ticket. Right. Well, the other problem, too, and we're seeing this more and more, is that there's all sorts of other hoops you have to jump through to buy a car, even in cash, like credit checks. Remember that? The guy really wanted you to do a credit check. And then there was a, um, <laughs> what was that other form he, he, was, he was trying to make you sign? There was another form. Well, that, well, we, so we leased a Nissan Leaf. No, right? no, no. This guy... You're saying tried to make you another form. That yeah, said, he he he, wanted, he said he said what we can do is basically you could run a credit check on you, which dings your credit, right? Sure. Uh, and then we'll sign a contract, basically saying that you're borrowing the money, and then when the check cashes, then you will uh, will tear up that contract. Right. And I'm like I'm like wait ho ho hold on, so we're gonna tear up the contract because that check will cash. So why are we even doing this? Right, so he's trying to protect his back again, and again, and again, 
even at the detriment of like your credit score and your ability to borrow money, which is just pretty wild. That's pretty, pretty, pretty bold of, of these people. So, I mean, it was a really bad experience. We didn't get a particularly good deal on the car, worth noting, I think. No, it, we didn't. We, we, you know, the car was 63 new. It had 10,000 miles and we paid 53. I don't think we got a really great deal on it. No. So it was a really bad experience. And that is a typical dealer experience. I kind of feel like based on what a lot of our viewers tell us, that is pretty much what to expect. Yeah, yeah, you feel like you, you, you feel you, you, it, 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 for me buying a car is one of the happiest moments of my life because it, I love cars and I'm a huge enthusiast. And then you drive out of that, a dealership and you just feel like miserable. You feel like you've been a sucker. You feel like you've been you know bent over and and just really taken advantage of. It's just crazy how how that business model uh, tends to work. You, you don't feel like. This was, you know, a win-win, and what, and, and that whole experience probably took an hour and a half, Tommy, mm -hmm. as opposed to when we go to our local dealers and buy something, it takes five, ten minutes at most. Yeah, and that's an extreme. Right. I mean, most people don't have that kind of relationship. Yeah, that's a big extreme. Yeah. Right. I mean, the problem is there's a lot of there's a lot of paperwork in place actually to protect the consumer. I took a dealer training course, and and that paperwork takes a long time to get through. Financing takes a long time to get through, and the process in general is just a very slow experience. Even at Tesla, where it's all done online, with the Teslas we've purchased, taking delivery can be a long experience. I remember one time taking delivery of that Model Y, we were there for probably a good 50, 60 minutes just waiting for them to, to, to get through their the, the line of customers. So buying a car should be simple, but it never is. Yeah, with Tesla, the, the experience tends to be... Um, yeah. Just very kind of rudimentary. Like if there isn't a lot of customers, you bring them a check, you sign some paperwork, and they're like, "Here you go," uh, and then you're kind of just given the car. And, and sometimes the car is not clean. Sometimes the car is not charged fully. Uh, I mean, it's they like good dealers will have a really good delivery experience, right? The best ones will actually like pull a cover off the car. Like when we bought the 911, right? They pulled this cover off the car. Also terrible experience. It was also It was terrible. a really, really bad experience, yeah. <laughs> that was also a paperwork nightmare, and they tried to get some stuff over on us. It was also 90% of the experiences we've had at dealers, really, really bad. Except for a couple select experiences, just terrible. So let's talk about some other cars. Yeah, what else do we have in the fleet right now? Well, I also think we should talk about some cars that we've owned that we've both liked and disliked. Okay, let's go for it. So this is a hot take. So we have had a number of JL Wranglers, both at the company and then me personally. And the JL Wrangler came out in 2018. And Alex has one now, right? They, it's, it's kind of now a staple of the four-wheel drive community. And actually, the first Wrangler we owned wasn't very good in the JL lineup. So we had a white JL Rubicon four-door with that newly launched two liter turbo and the mild hybrid system, the e-torque system. And that thing wasn't very good. We didn't like it very much. Yeah, not loving that turbo. Uh, that, that comes from like a long line of two liter turbos that every European company is now, you know, for a long time, at least the last three or four years has been sticking every car possible. So, something happened in Europe and somebody just, you know, beat every executive over the head with a two liter turbo stick. Well, and hold on there, sport. That's the same exact thing in the U.S. Everywhere, yeah. everywhere, everywhere. The, the two-liter two turbo, turbo just became a thing, right? And it's not just like regular brands; it's Mercedes, BMW. They all have these two-liter turbos, and they still have them in a lot of their cars. Well, I learned why recently. Why is that? Because <laughs> if you look at the physics, okay, of what it takes to balance fuel economy, fuel consumption, and torque and power, two-liter turbo by the physics of it is the correct displacement. And, if, and it's interesting too, if you look at like the bore and stroke of these engines, they're also very, very, very similar to each other. So what, what, what we figured out is that particular displacement at a certain PSI is what creates the perfect blend of economy and power. So that's why everything is a two liter turbo. I thought that was interesting. Yeah, but somehow like, you know, like the Tacoma, the previous generation Tacoma and the transmission, the the six speed or a five speed? Six, six speed. Six speed. Yeah. Th th those are like bickering, like, you know, old husband and wife, right? Where like the, the engine and the transmission just never saw eye to eye. And so you'd be going down the road at like 65 and you look at the speedometer and you're like, hey, I'm going 55. How did that happen? Uh, and I feel that way with that two liter in the Jeep. It just doesn't 
doesn't work well. Well, I mean, just to say that maybe that's the correct displacement and power standpoint doesn't mean they're all going to be the same. They're all tuned differently. They all have different hardware components, right? And the two liter in the Jeep, the problem is it's very peaky. So it's got not a lot going on at idle. Then it all comes on in a huge wave of torque. You go flying backwards in the seat and then up top, it all kind of peters and dies off. So it's tough to drive smooth off-road, in my opinion. A lot of people really like their two-liter Jeeps. So this is just my opinion. And then when you coupled that with the mild hybrid system when that engine launched, which is now discontinued in that engine, it was kind of a mess. So actually the new two liters are a lot better than the first gen, I think, with that mild hybrid system. We actually had charging problems at the highest drivable point in the US, if you recall. I remember. At over 14,000 feet, the um, Mon charging, Mon charging Mon system. Mon Blue Sky now. Yeah, decided to, to stop charging the battery, which was not good. This is not the hybrid, this was just a regular. This was a hybrid. It was a hybrid? It was a hybrid. Oh. Yeah. Those early ones were hybrids. Okay. Yeah. So it was But it wasn't a plug-in hybrid. No, it wasn't, it wasn't a, a four by mild hybrid, yeah. Oh. Um kind of a mess. And um we also just got the wrong spec. It's just a very boring configuration of Jet Wrangler, and it was too expensive and it just didn't it didn't didn't feel right. It Plus was, they don't sound great. That's well, the other. they sound really bad. They yeah. they do sound like Blend Dyson hair dryers. Yeah, like blenders, yeah. yeah. So but, but having said that. Uh, you know, the 392 is the exact opposite. <laughs> well, sure. I'm not saying that every JL Wrangler is bad. I'm just saying that particular experience wasn't very good. And the Pentastar is great. Yeah. Now, I do get a lot of emails about what happened to that cheap Jeep I had. The cheap Jeep. Yeah. The, the Willys. You got engaged. Two-door red Jeep. <laughs> yeah, basically what happened was is life just kind of got in the way, and I realized that 30... $3,000 was better spent on um, things in my life that were more important at that time. And like I your lovely wife. I couldn't afford to have both. So the Jeep was sold. Now that, that shall, shall we break the news, though? No. We'll talk about it in the next podcast. You don't want to take the, give them the big news? We'll talk about it in the next podcast. Okay, all right, yeah. all right. Yeah, that'll be another episode. Well, I, hate, I hate doing that, though. Well, basically, my dad's alluding to we're actually buying another affordable jail Wrangler. Um, and you'll see that video over at TFL Off-Road. I'm really excited about this. It's actually cheaper than the one I had. Um, actually, it's not cheaper. It's more expensive. But the, the spec is lower where we're buying a, a very base model, two-door JL, uh, for a series coming up, which I'm really excited about. What are we calling that? Uh, Thrills without the bill. Yeah, so we, we found uh, the least expensive Wrangler in, that we could find, mm -hmm. basically, uh, to kind of replace that red one. Uh, that, that you had because we felt like we didn't tell that story completely and we wanted to tell the rest of the story. Uh, and so uh, the one you had was, a, well, well, we'll leave the rest of it for the video. But by the time you're listening to this, we have a, we'll, we, we will already own another Wrangler, and I'm super excited uh, because I love Wranglers, Tommy, and um, you know everybody out there when we do a Wrangler video says – they're just too expensive, and they are. They're, they are very expensive. Yeah. You know, they've gotten, especially, you'd think with the competition from the Bronco, it would do the exact opposite, but it, it hasn't. For some reason, Stellantis has kept inching the price. Well, maybe not even inching the price, you know, jumping the price up. Uh, and so we wanted to, to show that we, you can still get an affordable Wrangler, and you don't need all the bells and whistles necessarily to have a lot of fun out there. All right, so what are some other vehicles? We're not done with my Jeep. Okay, keep um, going. Some things I didn't like about that Jeep. Um, I really didn't like the manual transmission, actually. Mm. That was a, a real low point for me. Um, and I'm a big manual enthusiast, and I'm a big save the manual guy, but that particular manual is not very good. It's very rubbery. And the big problem with it is if you don't get the Rubicon, you don't have the transfer case and the rear end gearing for real off-road use. So that, that Sport, that Willy Sport had a 345 rear end, and it didn't have that upgraded... Um, uh, gearing in the transfer case. So what you ended up with was a very boggy vehicle off-road that was tough to modulate in in low speed situations. So first gear just simply wasn't short enough and sixth gear for highway use was too tall. So even stock, there were very, very few points where I could even get the car in the sixth gear without it just bogging the heck out of the engine. So fifth gear was even the top at like 70 miles an hour because six was too tall. So I didn't like that manual at all. That was actually one of the reasons I'm not that sad I sold it. If you're going to buy one, I would strongly recommend getting the automatic, which hurts me to say, but that eight speed is just so much better. Yeah. So, you know, I wonder what we're getting. Hmm. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. 
<laughs> All right. Uh, anything else you want to say about that, uh, that Willis? No, I, I or Willis, um, depending on how you like to say it. I, uh, I'm really excited about the new one, and I think that it's uh, going to be popular on the channel. I can't wait to. It's got roll up windows. Yes, it does. <laughs> still has the, the new one. Still, ha I think it's the last car sold in the U.S. with roll up windows and manual locks. I don't think there's anything else. That's a pain in the butt. <laughs> <laughs> All right, now let's talk about but this. This will be your vehicle, Tommy. So, so we want to. It's do a comp. For the record, it is a company vehicle. But you'll be driving. I'll be it. running the series, so that's why I'll be driving it. Yes. Um, I can't. Um, now that I am married, and after the wedding expenses, I can't afford to buy a new Wrangler. Um, but even a cheap one. But uh, it, we wanted to tell that story. I felt like that was an untold story. A lot of you felt like it just ended, and so we wanted to. We wanted to go back and revisit that. I hope. Hope you guys are happy with that. And we spent a lot of time trying to find one that is about as affordable as you can get. So you'll find out when you watch the video how much we end up paying for it. But so some other Jeeps of the modern era that we've owned recently. We had, this is this is one that was also pretty short-lived. We had a Jeep Grand Cherokee WK2 um, Trailhawk with the V8. Do you remember mm, that one, the 5.7? Yeah, I remember that one. I didn't love that you Jeep. You bought that one on kind of on a whim. Well, I bought that because um, for tax reasons. Okay. It was basically a tax buy at the end of the year because it was over six thousand, and so you got the you got the tax deduction if you kept it over the year. And it was kind of a placeholder between vehicles that we were getting. Um, and the accountant suggested that that might be a good way to lower our tax liability uh, legally, of course. Uh, and so what I didn't like about that one was not the the, the the vehicle itself. I actually liked it was a Trailhawk. I actually liked the look of it. I think it's a very handsome vehicle. It had the black you know hood, uh, but. Um, the build quality wasn't up to spec because every time I drove it, uh, the seat would rub against the center armrest and squeak, and it just drove me crazy. It was like, well, we probably could have got that warranty fixed. I probably could have, but we didn't buy it for a long term. But it was just, it, it's like it's like the the same issue I had with the. We can talk about that as well. The Grenadier, and you know, we bought that too early. Now everybody's talking about them. We bought it before anybody was talking about them. But when we bought them, it still had that super annoying European speed warning that if you exceeded the speed limit, it would ding at you. And I remember I just could not live with that because every time you cycled, in other words, every time you went to drop off your laundry, you know, went inside the house, turned it off, it would just come back on. And you had to go through a bunch of menus to turn it off. And then you could set a, a shortcut to turn it off. But if you had CarPlay, that would take over. And so then you couldn't find the shortcut. It, it was just and – and I just I – just, Felt that like the the brand didn't dot their um, T's and I mean cross their T's and dot their I's uh, because that was something that was a law in Europe and it would have taken like one line of code to delete that and yet they couldn't be bothered to do it. So I kind of kind of spoke to like like how serious they were about selling cars to America and I know that that may be unfair, but you know I'm like come on guys. Well, really, the good news is that technology might be coming to every car in California. At least. Yeah, so. Yeah. So <laughs> God help us. Yeah. Um, I, I'll be uh, driving that 911 a lot more. Um, <laughs> finishing on the Grand Cherokee. The old one. I think the Grand Cherokee WK2 is pretty cool, especially with the 5.7. Pretty powerful. Uses a ton of gas. But overall, a decent vehicle if dated on the inside, especially for when we bought that at the end of the production run. It yeah, was. Yeah, plus the new one's so much nicer looking. Yeah, I don't like the new one as much. Really? Yeah, I just, too I just, fancy. Okay, fair. Yeah. The old one was dated, but it was also very rugged. I think the new one has gone too upmarket. It had, well, price is certainly jammed at upmarket. And I really liked the V8 in the old one. That was a really interesting option that, that made that vehicle kind of special. Now, speaking of that Grenadier, that I think has been the my favorite new vehicle the company has ever purchased. Fair. I, 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 like I said, I, I did not like the car. There are two things. There, there were three major issues okay, I let had. Okay, let me guess. Let, let's see if I can guess. Right, guess the three it's issues the I same had. three issues everybody has. The steering. Uh, yeah, the steering off-road. Incredible. Remember yeah. when we took it in Hell's Revenge? I could not. I mean, I was blown away how good that thing was. And then you're going to say it's, it doesn't self-center on the road no, I don't, and it's I don't too care slow. About, I, don't, I don't care about the self-centering. I can drive the car. It just kind of, it's like... They, it's it, it the, the the best analogy I could tell you is it's like that old YJ we had right. That's no, a, it wasn't that bad at all. It was it was that it was bad. That, my YJ had twenty seven degrees of steering play before anything would happen in the front end. The 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 Grenadier precisely the Grenadier has it, it's a it's a 
It's a recirculating ball steering system. The problem with the Grenadier is they didn't dial in enough caster angle. So it feels like when you make a turn, the wheel doesn't want to come back to center. So you do a lot of steering to get that thing around. But it doesn't feel loose. That, that's a key difference between my YJ steering and that. It is a tight steering box. There's no play in it. It's not broken like mine was. It just doesn't have that positive engagement of a rack and pinion that you're probably used to. Next thing you're going to say, because everyone says that the seats aren't very good. People complain about the seats. Especially the rear seats. And then lastly, you're probably going to complain about the price. I'm not going to complain about the price. I'm going to complain about the lack of options for the price. There you go. Yeah. So so, so at what? how much was it? 85? We didn't have power seats. We didn't have heated seats. Sure. You know, we didn't have a heated steering wheel. At 85000 I just kind of feel like you can get a Land Cruiser for 25000 less that has all that. And those are, I don't want to trivialize it. Those are all very valid complaints, which is a big problem for the Grenadier. But... The reason I love that Grenadier is because it is the Porsche 911 GT3 RS of the off-road world. That's a good analogy. It is so purpose-tailored for one purpose that it sacrifices on-road driving dynamics and luxury features. It is a vehicle dialed in to be a simple, rugged, off-road vehicle first and foremost with such few concessions for on-road comfort and livability. And yes, that makes it a bad vehicle for 90% of people. But for me, that's why I absolutely loved it. It was so cool. Solid axle, locking differentials, off-road modes. I mean, it was such a fantastic vehicle. I really, really liked it. I mean, I mean, if you're, if you're going to take that analogy, I would say if you want that, get an XJ, a Cherokee with the 4-liter and build it out and you will have a better off-roader. For a lot less, if if you want, like if you want the pure race car, right, you could do the same thing for a lot less without having, you know, and and. But you could make that argument about a GT3 RS if you want a pre race car, go buy an old Lotus and, you, and, and then take and, the interior. And, out and the it. reason I said it's a good analogy is I I don't want a GT3 RS. I, I don't want that wing or I don't want all that aero, right? I want the car that that I can live with and let yes. The, the, the on-road versus off-road, it's always a compromise, right? The more sure. off-road worthy something is, the less on-road worthy is in the same, same way. It's like motorcycles, you know, dual sports, because I ride those a lot. The, the more dirt worthy a bike is, the, the less you want to take it on a road trip. The, uh, the problem and, with and I see I see that, but there are vehicles, Tommy, in that class. Yes. Range Rover, Land Rover, no. that managed to accomplish that without no, you know having, having crappy seats and you know lack of lack of. They amenities. don't. They don't accomplish that. They anymore. do. Name a Range Rover with a front locker. All right. Well, okay. But how often do you use a front locker? Name a la name a Land Rover you can get with. Oh, hold on. Let me finish that. Okay. First of all, and this is you're you're the proponent of this, right? You're the proponent of, of the fact that we didn't get uh, the off-road locker in the Defender, and that's because Range Rover's uh, terrain management system is so advanced that you practically don't need that unless you're you know, into some very extreme circumstances. But I'm saying a Grenadier... It's also... also The other thing about... Hang on. I'm, I, let, me, let me make an okay, argument. All right. Go for it. The Grenadier is designed to go into more extreme environments than a Defender ever will be. So a Defender doesn't need the locker because the kind of terrain you're going to be taking it into is not extreme enough to need a locker because it doesn't have a solid front axle and the crazy underbody protection of a Grenadier and the rock rails. It does have underbody protection. No. Oh, that little aluminum plate that says Defender on it compared to a Grenadier underneath? Crazy difference. Well, I, I didn't difference. say Defender. I said Range Rover. Yeah, but same Range Rover is even worse. Range Rover has nothing and, and underneath then, it. And then the other argument I would make is that Sir Jim Radcliffe, the guy who decided to build, and I, and I you know, I mean, he decided he wanted to build, and because you're building the old Defender, and so he built himself basically an old Defender uh, from the ground up. Sure. Uh, but you know, he, he comes from the overlanding world, and last time I checked, you didn't need a front and a rear locker to go overlanding. Sure. You needed a high payload. And and you can see that this vehicle is designed for overlanding, right? Sure. There are yeah. there are things in the side where you can stick like jerry cans. Sure, yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. So uh like I say, if you're overlanding and our friend Scott over at uh the Overland Journal, right, just drove it across Africa. Mm -hmm. Uh and more power to you, Scott, but you know, when I'm overlanding, I also want those creature comforts. No, I, I I think there's a lot to that. I want I comfy seats. And now of course they they can't build them because Ricaro is gone bankrupt and so they can't get those seats anyway so it's kind of a, a good lesson of how hard it is to build and sell cars in the world i love our defender it's very cool it's yeah. probably one of the top three vehicles i think um on my wish list right now it's so cool the problem is like i want to go run um let's say i want to go run all of ironclads which we just did in the tacoma and the in the Tacoma and the Ranger Raptor, yep. right? And there was a lot of scraping and it was a difficult trail, but that was such a 
fun day out on the trail. And I can't do that in the Defender 90 because we would tear up the side of it. Or we would potentially, you know, tear off some of that scratchy, felty stuff underneath the vehicle. Where in a Grenadier, it's fully locked and fully protected from the factory where I would have no qualms just taking that thing and hitting the track. I, I, I completely agree, Tommy. That thing is just unstoppable off-road. And it doesn't look like it because it doesn't look like it has enough ground clearance. Those, those tires, especially from a North American point of view, seem way too small for the size of that vehicle. Yeah. Uh, and I agree, off-road, it's uh, Superman. Uh, but... The problem is that that's competing against vehicles that, for the most part, spend 99% of their time sure. on the road, right? right? Well, the problem, the big problem with the Grenadier is it's a $55,000 vehicle they're charging $85,000 for. It's about 20 to 30 k too expensive. and um, But that's I, everything nowadays, I, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, well, maybe, maybe not. And I think maybe that's why I, I, I like the Grenadier so much is because it wasn't my money. And I think if I did have to spend 85000 of my hard-earned money on that thing, I would be pretty disappointed because you're right, it is missing 40 different convenience features that you expect for $85,000. So the concept in my brain works really well and I love driving it, but I think, good point you made, that if I had to pluck that money down, it, it would be a lot harder. And, and you know, uh, like I said, we had it early, people finally like figured out what they were because for a long time people didn't know what they were. And so we kind of, we kind of missed the wave on that one. We came in too early and I kind of regret that. Uh, but um, I was afraid that if we held on to it a lot longer, we would lose a lot of money on it. I think you're right. And, and you know, yeah, I'm, I'm not... doing a good enough job losing money on the old Porsche without <laughs> adding to that pain for the company by uh, doing it, you know, with uh, the cars that we buy. I'm not sure that it is going to tank like a used Land Rover would, but I think it certainly is a, has a good shot of it. Yeah, I, I think that, that that's a good point. Um, okay, cool. So let's keep going. Should we talk about some other stuff that we've owned? Yeah, some go for highlights. It. Yeah. So um, transitioning a little bit away, some of the highlights that we've had recently, and we've got a lot of old cars, but I think I know you started with the Porsche, but I think people are more interested in the new stuff. So let's talk about some of the newer stuff we've owned that was really good. The Chevy Bolt we had, the twenty three thousand dollar base model Chevy Bolt, two hundred and eighty miles of range. One of the best cars on the market, which has just been discontinued, which is such a bummer because it was amazing value for what you got. Really, really good. I know there's a lot of folks not sure about electric cars, but if you had a place to charge it at home, just having a toaster to cruise around town in for almost no money was awesome. What a great car. Yeah, and then there's that lesson, like the less you spend on a vehicle, the less money you can lose on it. And the converse of that is, of course, is that Model 3 performance that we had for a year where we were trying to break, we try to set, and it didn't resonate with you guys, so that's kind of on us, but we tried to create a new cannonball from Disney to Disney, basically 2,500 miles from Disney in California to Disney in Florida. Yep. Uh, from Orange County to Orange County, believe it or not. Yeah, pretty cool. Yeah, pretty cool. Yeah, nobody uh, but nobody, nobody really watched that, so we bought that car to do that cannonball, and then over the year we kept it. We kind of did some snow videos with it, but we ended up selling it at the exactly wrong time. It was when like Tesla... I uh, was lowering prices because Mr. Musk tends to throw, uh, you know, numbers into the wind and you never know like how much of a discount you can get depending on when you buy it. And then, of course, Hertz dumped their entire fleet of 100,000 Model 3s onto the market. Uh, yeah. And we lost $16,000 on that car. And yeah. I, I didn't love that car, Tommy. It I was, did like that car. It was pretty, it was very fun to drive. It was it was fast in a straight line. Uh, but it, but we haven't driven the new Highland uh, performance yet, uh, but, you know, the new Model 3 performance. Uh, but I heard it's much more tuned in so that it's not just fun in a straight line, but it's fun around a corner. That car wasn't that fun around a corner. Mm. Um, I, and we lost a ton of money on it. I think it's a good car. I would love to buy one used for $20,000, but at 53 or whatever we paid for it, yeah, it was old and it was just, um, it, it, it needed a refresh, which it now has. And apparently the Highland performance is, is much better. Um, so another car that we had, which I think we both like quite a bit, was we had, for about, a, about eight months, we had a Ford Mustang GT, also the cheapest GT you could buy. Um, yeah, that I, one hurt. I, loved, I, I, really, I was really bummed to sell that because that had the best exhaust note. We had the custom, not custom, but we had the optional uh, active exhaust, mm -hmm. uh, which just uh, made that car sound like, you know, I, I use this too much, but God laughing. It was incredible. Not particularly fast for a car with 486 I disagree. horsepower. I mean, that that we race that thing against some really modern performance cars, and nothing could keep up with it. 
it was the problem is you're comparing it. We had the Model Three performance at the same time. Sure, yeah. You can't you can't use that electric car. Right. And and compared to that, ruler, it was slow. Yeah. But compared to any internal combustion engine at a mile above sea level, the thing really shot above its weight class. Even compared to some AMG products, it was so quick in an in, in a straight line. It, what a machine! 486 horsepower with that new Gen 4 Coyote engine, the new S650 Mustang, really was an impressive performer. My problem with that car is if you if you got the base back like we did, we had the base. The only option was that op, you know that performance exhaust. It, it kind of felt like a Coyote shipping crate, and what I meant is you're spending I think it was like forty two thousand dollars for an engine that happens to have a Mustang attached to it. Yeah, because the rest of the car was a little rental carry. The interior quality was pretty poor. A lot, of mouse, a lot of mouse fur. A lot of mouse fur, yeah. Um, a lot of hard plastics. A lot of hard plastics. A lot, a lot of like, 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 pretty much the uh, the bases of all season tires. So like, it's a performance car, and yet you've got kind of these, you know. Yeah. Really. And they weren't even all that, you know, like they weren't that fat, and the wheels were also kind of just black wheels. Black wheels are kind of. Having said that, I not would. Grand. The the wheels looked like they were from a grand piano. They were really bad. But having said that, even though I complained about the interior. In some of the quality things, that is still the version to get because it had a really soft and supple ride. So those ugly small wheels meant they had a fat sidewall and it was a really comfortable Cre cruiser. Incredibly, incredible grand touring vehicle. The problem is everybody gets the performance package with the high-end suspension. and the, When we had it here, we compared the two. Yeah, the nice brakes. And that car rides poorly and ultimately doesn't handle all that well because it still is a big, heavy Mustang. So the one to get is the one we had. Just live with the crummy interior, but get the soft, squishy suspension because unless you're actively tracking the car, that's the way to go. Couple of problems with ours. Pretty scary over 110 miles an hour. I didn't find that to be true, but you said we, we took it. Now keep in mind, we're doing this on a closed course. We have an airstrip. An air, airstrip, so we're not doing this on the highway. So I, I had Case try it too, and he felt the same way. You get this really unnerving float as the car kind of starts to fight the arrow, and the suspension just doesn't have the composure at those speeds without the performance pack. Performance pack is fine. Pretty alarming. And then um, the, the, the handling characteristics of the car, like if you want a car to go have fun in the canyons with, the base Mustang is really not it. It was just so soft and rolly that it, 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 it didn't have a lot of composure in the turns. So that, that was the problem with that car. Plus, a, a, a cheap all-season meant it didn't have any grip either. So pretty scary in the corners. But as long as you're not expecting that, what a machine. What a great just commuter, fun, straight-line blaster. That was the one to get. Yeah, yeah. And then, of course, the one that I kind of bought as a uh, uh, dream vehicle for myself was we had a 911 uh, Targa. Mm -hmm. um, 2024, uh, ordered it during COVID. Uh, and um, that's was, you know, one of those probably COVID decisions that, that wasn't a great business decision, but that, you know, during COVID you make those decisions like, well, how long am I going to live? You know, is this the end of the world? So let's get that dream car. Uh, and I, I really love that car, Tommy. Uh, but there were some issues with it. You know, the, uh, the, 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 the problem with the 911 Targa is it's the heaviest of the 20, I think, eight versions of the 911 that are out there right now. So I had a Targa S, so that does bump up the horsepower. But the, 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 the only complaint that I had, and I didn't care about the weight, uh, didn't buy the manual because I don't like the seven-speed in the Porsche. I don't like the seven-speed in any vehicle, even like the C7 Corvette. I don't mm. understand why that seventh gear yeah, is that there. that was dumb. Unless you're on the Autobahn, right? Yeah. Uh, so I bought the, you know, bought the automatic. Uh, but the problem I had with it was that when you uh, put the Targa down, it just had a lot of wind noise. I it mean, had a lot of buffeting. A lot yeah. of buffeting, yeah. And it's like, what's the point of having a Targa where when you you know when you take it down, which is a really beautiful almost operatic dance, but then all this wind is blowing that you can't even hear the stereo, and you're like, yeah, it's kind of the worst of both worlds. Yeah, no, I really had a lot of buffeting problems, and look, he's an amazing performer. Another car that was so underrated on paper, the quarter mile even at a mile above sea level was like high 11s, which is crazy yeah, for a non. It was the fastest car we have outside of the Tesla performance. Yeah. Crazy quick, handled really well. You didn't feel the weight. My problem with it was just the fundamental side of things that we paid 151,000 for it, 
And luckily, we sold it where we got 151000 out of it. Sold it for sticker, yeah. Yeah, because they were going still over sticker by the time we sold the car. Of course, we waited almost two years for it. Too. Yeah, and we had to pay taxes. We lost a lot right. of money in taxes. Is, yeah. um, but the, the problem I had with that car is I, you would just get behind the wheel and you think like, wow, think of all the experiences you could have for $151,000 that would be more exciting than this. Right, the car was fun and it was really quick when you were on it, but it didn't feel all that exotic for that insane price point, right? You could get, you know, um, a lot of other vehicles like a GR Corolla that, that in some ways feel more exciting on a regular basis with the little pops in the bangs of the manual transmission than this 911. I'm with you 100%, Tommy. And the reason we sold it was sell it while the going's good. And, and those cars are still very valuable. So if, if you know, we got sticker for it. I'm sure whoever the dealer who bought it is reselling it for over sticker, which is right. fine. Uh, we were happy to get what we paid for it because you know we make our money making videos, not flipping cars. Uh, but uh, I just every time I saw it, I just kept thinking to myself, that's so much money that we could put into other cars uh, that we could make or other trucks that we could make videos with, right? right. That's, that, that's three or four cars, and that's one of the reasons we're buying this new Wrangler is because we sold the 911, and now we have this money in the car budget that we can use to buy other vehicles. That's another reason we bought the, the second Model T. Sure, so, yeah. So you know, you were exactly right. So for the price of that 911, you can have a new Wrangler. You can have a Model T. You can have, uh, well, we're getting a Maverick, so you can have a Maverick. Right, and, and still have like $70,000 left. And create a lot of content, which and, is basically our business model. And actually, that was an interesting buy. This was the car that was the biggest surprise, I think, for me this year was you went out and bought this 10-year-old BMW i8 for about $50,000, $47,000, I think you paid for it. And for $47,000, that car feels so much more special and is so much more of an experience than the $150,000 911. And yes, it's not as quick, doesn't handle half as well, and doesn't have, I think, that kind of Porsche tax attached to it. And therefore, I really think that's a much more exciting vehicle with the crazy hinged doors, right? And the, the those insane wide body looks and the weird, bizarre vents. And I mean, obviously, it's a lot slower and has this weird three-cylinder hybrid system. But it's not that slow. No, it's not that slow. It's slower than 911, yes, but it's not that slow. But it's still all-wheel drive. Still, it looks better. I think uh, it dude, looks I'm better. I'm getting 64 MPG. And, you know, there's two ways you buy a car with your head and with your heart, Right. right. Uh, so the 911 is definitely kind of a hard thing. But the i8 was one of the very first uh, plug-in hybrids. And I just love the technology in that car. I love the fact that it's got a carbon fiber tub, so it's super light. Mm -hmm. I love the fact that, you know, uh, for everything I do around town, I drive it on all electricity. It's got like 20 miles of all electric range. Uh, and then if I do go any farther, it just seamlessly switches over to the internal combustion engine. And then the other thing it does is, even though it's got a three-cylinder out of a Mini, uh, BMW kind of does a good job of faking you into thinking it's a much bigger engine. It does do a nice job of pumping in a very fake exhaust sound that sounds yeah. really good. And then, interestingly enough, because it is that hybrid system, when you use a launch control, it still does zero to 60 even at a mile above sea level in about 4.3, 4.4 seconds. So it's a really quick car when you get on it. So it's a really great combo of um, design and also kind of livability. I think if they had put a naturally aspirated V8 in it, it would be not a $50,000 car, it'd be a $100,000 car because those looks are so phenomenal. Having said that, from a livability standpoint, that hybrid system is actually very useful. Yeah, you know, to me it's like this, like my teeth, right? Those are veneers, mm -hmm. right? And my original teeth were pretty damn ugly, right? And uh, I'm so much happier with my fake teeth uh, than I am with my original teeth. And sometimes, you know, fake can be better than real, as much as I love real, right? Because you want to be authentic and genuine. But that's kind of how I feel about the... The i8, even though I know it's only got a three-cylinder, BMW does a good job in faking me into thinking between the 120-horsepower front motor and then that 230-some horsepower rear engine into thinking that that car has a much bigger power plant. And it works. It just works for me. And uh, it puts a huge smile on my face. Plus, I don't, like with the Porsche, this is another thing I'm not good at. I am not good at having very expensive cars because I just worry about them too much. Like this thing, I'll park anywhere. It's plastic, so if somebody bangs the door <laughs> into car it. carbon fiber. It's not plastic. Well, no, the outside panels are oh, plastic. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so <laughs> I'm not that stressed about it. Right, uh, it's already been depreciated because those were hundred fifty thousand dollars cars when they were new, and so now it's down to like you said fifty thousand uh, dollars. And um, 
it's pretty like I, what's amazing about that car is there's not a squeak. I've never been in a nine year old car that doesn't have a squeak or a rattle or something. Yeah, it's really good. Right. I mean, this was BMW's moonshot between this and the i3. Uh, and I, I just think that these cars over time are going to pre- appreciate. And so while I can still get in and out of it, Tommy. Yeah, <laughs> which that's is, the problem. It's very hard to get in and out of it. Which is okay. Uh, I want to take advantage of it and drive it. Well, dude, we've gone way over an hour. Well, yeah, because I was super late because I couldn't get the car started. Yeah. Um, but um, let's just really quick, yeah. uh, in, in conclusion, let's talk about what the company currently owns um, in terms of our long-term test vehicle. So we still have the Ranger Raptor. Yes. We still have the Tesla Cybertruck. Yes. We have the Land Rover Defender 90. Yes. Which uh, is outside. Um, what else do Cummins? we have? Cummins. Ram 2500 Cummins. Yes. Nissan Leaf. Nissan Leaf. Which is uh, it's a lease, and that car has been awesome. We can talk about that on another podcast. Um, what other new stuff do we have? I think that's – we got the i8. That's a newer thing. Yeah, six, so six right now. That's it, I think. Yeah, and coming, we've got the Wrangler today, which yes. I'm super stoked for. And then we've got a Volkswagen ID Buzz yes. coming in the next hopefully month and a half. And, then a, and then a Maverick. Ford Maverick. Yep. And then uh, the fun one is we have a, uh, um, a military truck coming, that Boyce – Boys, a deuce yeah, and a half. Deuce and a half, but that's not till next spring. So that that's going to be really cool. So um, we're probably going to do some shifting around, like maybe the. Well, I think I think as much as I like the Ranger Raptor, that's going to have it's to probably going to have to go. That's going to have to go. Uh, I mean, you know, there's only so much budget, uh, the, and so the idea is to keep rolling the same money into new cars. The current plan, which I'm really, and the cu- Cummins is going to have to go. The current plan, which I'm really excited about, um, and I, I think it's going to work well, is I've been shopping for. An EV for my wife because she's she's got this old Honda that she commutes to work with. CRV. Um, and I'd, I'd like to just get her in something safer with some more modern technology. It's it's going on 18 years old now. And um, so we've, we've been shopping for affordable EVs and, and there's just been nothing that, that really fits what we need. So I think what we're going to do is when we're done with the Maverick, I think we're going to buy that off the company for her. Um, and I think that's going to be like a perfect little commuter truck for her. It's a hybrid all-wheel drive. I convinced them to get the heated seat package. Um, thank you for doing that. It's dark green. She likes the color. It's going to be, have a little truck a bed. green, Tommy. Yeah, but it's also going to be well under $40,000. So, you know, we, we, we can afford it. So I think that's going to be a really cool thing. I'm really excited about that. So hopefully, if Andre doesn't break it in the next year. Um, that'll be your <laughs> wife's that'll be, car. That'll be Morgan's yeah, car. Yeah, and, and the reason we're buying that is for the first time, you can get both hybrid and all-wheel drive. Yeah, and uh, look, the fact of the matter is the Maverick is such a hot little truck so much interest in it still years into when it launched that I think that's going to be popular on the channel. Uh, XLT we got, right? Yep. Pretty base model. For, yeah, we always try to get, you know, the, the one that is a meat. Like the, the Tremor would have been cool or the Lobo would have been cool or of the course. Lariat. Um, but then you're getting into forty, fifty thousand dollars almost. Why did we not? There's a reason we didn't get the XL, and I forgot what that reason. Uh, because was. Of the interior is just so uh, dour. It's all gray. And for video, that's pretty bad. Yeah, and when you get into the XLT, you start to get splashes of color. Yeah. So XLT, I think, is also kind of the meat of the market. I, I think people would have clicked on the XL, but people would have bought the XLT. Yeah, and the XL also had these like base wheels, which are kind of ugly. Yeah, and they're tiny. It just looks undertired. So we'll have a lot of content of that um, shortly, which I'm really excited about. Um, but anyways, let's uh, let's wrap this one up, Dad. Thank you for listening to today's po- car podcast. Yeah, and thank you for um, you know putting up with my ums and uhs as I was here by myself, uh, you know, before Tommy got here. And then if you guys want to help support the team, uh, head on over to Patreon. You can get this podcast without commercials. Mm-hmm. You can get our videos ahead of time. You can get behind the scenes videos. So all the stuff we talked about, all our Patreons know. And they're not just, it's not, you know, we're actually showing stuff in those because we're filming those. Uh, and yeah, we really appreciate that you guys keep uh, watching and stay tuned for that, uh, that, that, what, what'd you call that series again? Um, Thrills Without the Bills? Thrill Without the Bill. Yeah. Exactly right. So stay tuned for that. That's coming very soon to Off Road. Yep. We'll see you next time, folks. Ciao.